thank you very much for the uh, invitation from the Institute, and I really welcome this opportunity to engage with uh, Turkish colleagues. Uh, what I'd like to do briefly is to sketch the relationship between enlargement and integration, or widening and deepening. I've been, I'm a specialist in European integration, and within that, a subspecialist on enlargement studies. I wrote my PhD on the Eastern enlargement of the EU, and I'm writing a book currently about the EU's relationship with the Western Balkans. Um, I think there's a real sense that enlargement has diminished as a political priority for the EU over the last number of years, uh, particularly as it's had to grapple with the different disintegrative dynamics of the Eurozone. There's been an understandable knock-on impact on enlargement as a political priority. And this is evident if you read the documentation emanating from the Commission, if you consider the kind of mood music that's been coming out of Brussels. <coughs> and also, there's a less ambitious operational uh, framework attached to uh, the process. And I'll say a bit more about that uh, in a few minutes. But I think it's worth acknowledging that there's nothing new about this. If we go back to the late 1990s, there were, as much as Eastern enlargement was a priority for the EU, a declared priority, there were real fears about the final stages of negotiations uh, and that the accession process would not be delivered or would be delayed uh, very significantly. And I think we can be glad uh, in many senses, that there was a successful conclusion to negotiations at the end of 2002. Imagine if those uh, negotiations had moved on into 2006, 7, and 8. We'd be in a very different place um, uh, in respect of those uh, conclusions. So there is this distinct sense of gloom, if you like, which pervades the enlargement uh, framework. And this has led to all kinds of speculation about a uh, change in the kind of guiding framework for negotiations, that uh, some kind of multi-speed vehicle or vehicles would be necessary to um, guide relations with the Western Balkans and more especially with Turkey. Now that's been resisted in all kinds of ways in some of the member states and within the Commission because they have developed over time and especially through the Eastern Enlargement Round, a more or less unitary enlargement framework where negotiations take place around 35 chapters, where there are benchmarks set, and these have become progressively tougher over time, uh, but where there is at least the prospect for those application, uh, those applicants that negotiate a, a terminus at the end of the process. Um, but the multi-speed uh, perspective is one that has gained traction significantly, and it's partly because of developments within uh, the Eurozone. Uh, you don't need to be told, I think, that there are all kinds of suggestions about variable geometry, about a Europe of different speeds, about a core uh, and outer core, and so on. And these have, in some senses, accelerated. Uh, but none of this is particularly new either. If we think back to uh, the 1990s, the negotiation of the Maastricht Treaty, there were very similar debates about the finalité of the integration process and whether all member states could proceed along the same track, uh, uh, given their different uh, perspectives on uh, integration uh, uh, broadly declared. Uh, so, as much as those disintegrative dynamics seem to be in the ascendancy currently, uh, that's not necessarily going to remain the case. And I think there is uh, a very significant space there in which uh, successful negotiation of the current nego of the, uh, enlargement round with the West <coughs> and potentially with Turkey uh, can be uh, achieved. Now, just to say something about this relationship between widening and deepening and how it has evolved over the years. Uh, back in the 1960s, when Britain was the elephant in the room, so to speak, uh, and occupied the position that Turkey does now, there were real fears amongst the core integration states that the British accession into the EU would dilute the impulses towards closer cooperation. 
And even at that time, there were suggestions, uh, once the British uh, veto exercise by de Gaulle had been unblocked, that the answer to accommodating uh, this new presence within the integration scheme uh, was some kind of variable geometry or multi-speed system. We can see this in the proposals of uh, Darendorf, later of Leo Tendemans in 1975 in the report uh, on European Union. So what I'm saying here is that the EU has always grappled with the tensions between impulses towards deeper integration economically and politically and the challenges posed by accommodating particularly larger states uh, within the accession context. Now, if we look at the multi-speed environment, there are all sorts of uh, elements that we can cite within the core integration uh, frameworks. If we look at economic and monetary union, prior to uh, the current crisis, um, you know, it, there were members of the Eurozone and those who preferred to stay outside the Eurozone. If we look at Schengen, uh, there's another clear example where this multi-speed uh, system has been operated. And at the moment, there are very kind of conflicting elements where within the Eurozone, there is this determination amongst core states, states to move ahead towards a much firmer uh, political underpinning of the EMU, uh, but at the same time, acknowledgement that there are real difficulties amongst some of those states uh, in moving in those uh, kind of uh, directions. There are, of course, also... Um, other disintegrative impulses there from beyond the Eurozone. If we look at the debate in our nearest neighbour, for example, um, <coughs> whether Britain might withdraw, uh, whether a new British government post-election is able to successfully renegotiate the terms of British membership. Uh, there's a lot uh, there which is in doubt, but nevertheless, again, is pointing towards a multi-speed uh, trajectory. If we look at the development of secessionist movements uh, across different regions of Europe, from Scotland to Catalonia, there were also plenty of disintegrative uh, forces and uh, disintegrative elements. Now, I mention that because there has developed over time through the stewardship of the European Commission, uh, a particular model through which accession is achieved and a particular model through which the uh, negotiations uh, are operationalized. At the core of this is this strong conditionality element. There's an asymmetry of power, if you like, between uh, inside and outside actors. Uh, and this has allowed the EU to really penetrate very deeply the governance architecture uh, and both politics and policy within outside states. And that's something I think that isn't acknowledged uh, enough uh, within the European Union. The demands that are asked of candidate states are now extraordinary relative even to the Eastern Enlargement Round. And it was through the Eastern Enlargement Round in a sense that the Commission learning from some of the mistakes that it made uh, but responding to you know, different problems that it uh, perceived within its negotiating environment actually developed a much higher threshold just around the kind of things that Haluk uh, was mentioning. So the uh, challenge, if you like, of negotiating accession has become a much more significant one than it was even for Poland, uh, Hungary and other states that successfully entered the EU in 2004. The EU's uh, model, if you like, is one which um, within academia, which politi uh, in political science, we refer to uh, as the external incentives model. The EU uh, provides rewards uh, for progress within particular uh, areas of policy within the 35 chapters uh, and disincentives at the same time uh, in the form of exclusion or the threat of exclusion uh, at particular points uh, in the process. And there's been a, a, you know, a particular uh, trajectory through which the Commission has emphasized the rule of law and the embedding, the deep embedding in, of the rule of law within candidate countries as they come closer to uh, 
membership. And this has been quantified in a sense by the employment of these benchmarks uh, in a much more intrusive way, in a much more intensive way than was used uh, previously. Now, the, the EU, I suppose, could point to certain successes uh, within the enlargement sphere. Croatia will become the 28th member state when it joins on the 1st of July. There has been some progress in the Western Balkans with the start of accession negotiations with Montenegro uh, in sight, candidate status for Serbia. The relationship between Serbia and Kosovo seems to be improving, uh, much against expectations. And um, I think you could argue that the transformative power uh, of enlargement is evident in some of those areas. But the, um, it, it continues to be the case that um, the political environment is extremely difficult. And this is where we encounter this phenomenon of enlargement fatigue. Now, again, this is something that one finds in the discourse on enlargement in recent years, but there's nothing new about that, this either. If we go back to the late 1990s and the early 2000s, uh, you can track this in some way <coughs> through uh, the front pages of The Economist magazine, where they uh, regularly talked about the EU going cold on enlargement uh, and so on. Uh, but there are particular uh, phenomena, I think, which have made this that bit more difficult. One of them is the rather partial and incomplete accession of Bulgaria and Romania. Uh, this is something that uh, has, uh, if you like, crops up in almost every discussion, especially about the Western Balkans uh, more than uh, Turkey. Uh, there is a sense, I think, that the Bulgarians and Romanians were not ready for membership, uh, and that um, the EU, in a sense, turned uh, a blind eyes to some of the uh, <clears throat> terribly corrupt practices amongst elites in both countries, uh, and that, in a sense, uh, accession was premature. Um, now, I've spent a lot of time in both countries over the years, and I certainly acknowledge there's some merit in that, but I have taken the view, and uh, I really, really uh, agree very strongly with you on the visa issue, uh, that the best way to manage some of those problems is to actually uh, proceed at the political level and ensure the accession takes place and then allow a space for uh, work on those things uh, when that candidate states has the certainty of actually becoming a member. Because this is something that comes through very strongly over recent accessions that EU policy only works if candidate states have a real and substantive sense, not only that they're being treated fairly within the negotiations, but also that the, the offer of membership which has been made is going to be followed through. In other words, that there will be a successful negotiation, uh, a successful outcome to the negotiations. And over the last number of years, I mean, I absolutely agree with you, Sarkozy and others were planting doubt for political reasons on a process that uh, otherwise uh, was designed <coughs> to ensure that there would be compliance with uh, EU demands and a successful outcome uh, to negotiations. Uh, in the Bulgarian and Romanian case, there's been um, another phenomenon more recently, uh, and that is this kind of targeting of both nationals in Britain, in Germany, and in other countries, uh, uh, by tabloid newspapers in particular, all of this designed to give the impression that immigration is a huge problem when it actually isn't. All of it designed to give the impression that there is significant pressure on labor markets when there isn't. Uh, in the Irish case, for example, in, in the British case, uh, there's a very thorough uh, commission report on the impact of Eastern enlargement on labor markets. And it demonstrates that uh, for all of the political importance attached to this in Britain, uh, Germany accepted almost as many citizens from Central and East Europe uh, in the run-up to and after the 2004 accession. And actually, it's even more remarkable in the Irish case, if we look at the last cent uh, census, uh, about 4% of our population uh, now uh, are people who uh, come from Poland, Hungary, and other uh, 
cases. In the British case, it's about 1.1%. And I'm glad to say we haven't had that very nasty xenophobic uh, edge to that kind of debate here. But it is there, and it's one of the things uh, which has been, um, if you like, in the shadows as the current enlargement round has been progressing. Uh, there's also something else that's disturbing um, uh, 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 about um, the current round, uh, and that is the creeping nationalization or bilateralization of um, uh, the negotiations. We saw some of this in respect of maritime boundaries in the relationship between Croatia and Slovenia. Uh, we see obstacles being placed in front of candidate states regularly now, much more regularly than in the past, uh, uh, which points to this creeping um, bilateralization. Um, so there are dangers there. And we see this in the case of Iceland as well, the way the British and the Dutch tried to put in place uh, uh, you know, a, 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 a veto, in a sense, around uh, reimbursement uh, uh, of deposits in, in that banking uh, framework. And finally, I think here there is an increasing uh, gap, and I think this is really important and not understood very well, uh, between the EU's own vaunted standards expressed in the Copenhagen criteria on democracy, the quality of democratic institutions, uh, and the kind of thresholds that are placed before candidate states uh, uh, on a very regular basis. And if you look at the evidence of what's going on within the member states, uh, you can see that a clear majority of the current member states would actually fail uh, the tests that are being set for the Western Balkan states and for Turkey. You, if you look at Romania and Hungary in particular, the regression from democratic norms and democratic practices, real concerns about the Orban government's muzzling of the press and uh, of the courts. Uh, these are getting nothing like enough attention within the shadow of the Eurozone crisis, but they're real and they're important and they point to a kind of hypocrisy which in, within the process, which has always been there and to some extent is understandable because when you're inside and negotiating with outsiders, you have all the cards or all the advantages. But these things are being increasingly exposed, and it means, I think, that uh, the EU's political capital or its stock of goodwill within candidate states is evaporating. Now, that has a simple knock-on effect, I think, in terms of negotiations, and that is that people who are engaged in sometimes very costly reform processes as the demands are made from Brussels to reform legal systems, customs uh, uh, operations, or, or, or other things, uh, that their incentive for reform is reduced very substantially by the kind of signals that they are getting regularly uh, from Brussels. Uh, and I think there are all kinds of um, ways in which um, uh, this matters within the process. But the key thing is that uh, you are uh, trying, in a sense, in very difficult circumstances, to keep reform processes ongoing, but where the incentives and rewards available to those that are engaging in these often very costly uh, processes uh, are significantly less in rational terms than uh, those that you might expect to produce a successful outcome. So even if you look at this problem in those functional terms, there are real problems in the way that the EU model has operated and is operating currently. Now, I'll, finally, I'll say this. Um, uh, there is nothing particularly new here except that the overall political atmosphere is significantly worse than it was, that the um, uh, problems associated with the Eurozone uh, have not just deflected attention from the goal of enlarging to the Balkans and Turkey, um, but have also in some senses placed new obstacles before uh, negotiators. Uh, if you think about the treatment of Cyprus, for example, and you uh, put yourself in the position of somebody uh, in Belgrade or in Tirana, uh, and you try to 
relate that to concepts of solidarity and you wonder how is a small state you're going to be treated within the EU you know, once you get over the line, if you do get over the line of membership. Uh, and even before you reach that point, you have to wonder about whether the treatment of small states will actually change uh, relative to uh, the way it has operated um, previously. Okay, now finally, um, just to draw some of the strands of this together, uh, the EU, it goes without saying, has a very successful story to tell with Eastern enlargement. Uh, you know, three quarters of the current member states are actually former uh, enlargement countries. In other words, weren't part of the original heterogeneous uh, core. The EU has continued to act as a magnet for outside states, uh, but its ability to actually act as a mobilizing agent or as an agent of reform has weakened very significantly. Now, I think this is of real concern, uh, not just because uh, in Bosnia, for example, the peace is very, very fragile indeed, without any constitutional settlement there. Uh, and in all kinds of other respects, there's a fragility about the process, which kind of echoes the fragility uh, within the Eurozone and within uh, the EU. Uh, if there are going to be uh, successful outcomes to negotiations, they crucially depend on the goodwill of the European Union as a negotiator, on the kind of reward structures that are offered to candidate states. Uh, but more important than any of that, I think, is um, whether the promises that have been made to Turkey, and in the Western Balkan case at Thessaloniki in 2003, whether there is a real sense amongst negotiators that those promises are going to be uh, honored, at least in the sense of uh, substantive negotiations with no predetermined outcome uh, uh, within them. I think there is real um, doubt in the minds of many negotiators right across the Balkans and elsewhere about the seriousness of intent uh, and indeed the capacity of the EU to deliver on enlargement in the current context. Thanks.